the name of Jesus Christ, the holy, innocent Son of God, who took on our humanity and set aside his eternal power and glory for a little while, so that you and I, by his death, might be set free from the sin that you and I had committed, so that you and I would not receive the punishment that we deserved. To him be glory and praise now and forever. The word of God for our devotion this evening, this Good Friday, is from John's Gospel. We read there from the 19th chapter. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I'm bringing him out to you that, to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. In the name of the sacrificial lamb of God, my fellow redeemed. He stood there in the Roman governor's courtroom he was on trial for the charges of attempting to be a rival king to the Caesar and for attempting a rebellion against the Roman government. He was on trial for treason. At least those were the charges that were brought against him. As he stood there, he was a poor excuse for a savior, which was what he had claimed to be. Blood was running down his face from the crown of thorns that they had smashed down around his head. There was blood caked on his back from the whipping and the beating that he had received from the Roman soldiers. He had been humiliated by those same Roman soldiers who had dressed him up in a rag of a purple robe. And, and then mockingly fell down and bowed down on their knees before him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and laughing each time that they said it. As he stood there, he did absolutely nothing to try to defend himself. When the accusations were made, he didn't deny any of them. When, when the Roman governor Pontius Pilate interrogated Jesus, Jesus didn't even give him a single answer to any of his questions. When the soldiers beat him and whipped him, 
He never told them to stop or he didn't even tell them to back off a little bit. Even when the people and their leaders out in the Pilate's courtyard stood there crying out, crucify him, crucify him, he did nothing to try to get out of the way of the crucifixion that certainly was coming. Instead, Jesus stood there and he quietly took it all. And yet as he did so, he showed a quiet confidence and finally he did surprise Pilate with one answer to a question. As Jesus stood before the Roman governor that Friday morning, this was not the first time that he had been on trial before those in authority who were over him. That had already started the night before when the Jewish leaders had arrested him and taken him to the high priest's house under the cover of darkness of nighttime. There he was put on trial before a man by the name of Annas, who although he was not the high priest anymore, that was his former office, was still a powerful and influential man among the people. After that, they carted him off to the current high priest, a man by the name of Caiaphas. Caiaphas himself was an important and a powerful man. He had received his appointment from the Roman governor himself, and on top of it, Caiaphas was a shrewd and a clever politician. He knew how to get things done, and he could be pretty ruthless about it. On top of that, he held a lot of power with the people. Not only was he the appointed leader of the people of, by the Romans, he stood and presided over that Jewish court and that Jewish ruling body that you and I know as the Sanhedrin. And Caiaphas was also an enemy of Jesus. Along with the rest of the Jews and the Jewish leaders, he had watched Jesus' ministry with mounting and growing fear and horror. Jesus had gathered a large following among the people around him, and he had become more popular than the leaders themselves were among the people. All the miracles that he did didn't help anything either. That just made Jesus even more popular, and of course it didn't help that Jesus had publicly accused those Jewish leaders of being a bunch of hypocrites and a brood of vipers. And then not too many days before this, when Jesus publicly raised a man by the name of Lazarus from the dead, things finally came to a boiling point. As the leaders met together, they knew that they had to do something about Jesus. As they met together, they said, here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Their power, their influence, their position was at stake. Caiaphas was the hype, the high priest was the one who finally came up with the solution to their problem. Standing up in the Sanhedrin among all of them, he finally said, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Sacrifice Jesus, he said, and all this commotion around Jesus will just finally go away. And then everything will go back to the way it was before. We'll have our power, we'll have our position, the people will follow us again and everything will be good again. And so that Thursday night out in the garden, they arrested him. They found him guilty and on trial and on some trumped up charges and passed the death sentence. And now he stood before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. 
The Jewish leaders had turned Jesus over to Pilate early that Friday morning, and Pilate himself was a very powerful man. He had received his appointment as the governor of, of that province by the emperor Tiberius Caesar himself. And, and, and as the governor, he held authority over Jerusalem and the entire province, and he held control of the occupying Roman army in that entire province. They did whatever they, he told them to do. He had the power to execute. He had the power to pardon someone. He was the power of imperial Rome in Jerusalem and all of Judea. As Jesus stood there on trial before him, the Jews were out in the courtyard hurling their accusations against him and amazingly, Jesus said absolutely nothing. As Isaiah put it before, as a lamb before her shears is silent, he didn't open his mouth. Even when Pilate questioned him over and over again, Jesus said absolutely nothing. Finally, Pilate got angry with him. Got angry with him for not answering him. And he, and he said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power either to, to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus finally spoke. Pilate must have been amazed and surprised at Jesus' answer as he said, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. You see, Jesus was not the helpless victim that he appeared to be. He had performed miracles. He had calmed the wind and the waves. He had walked on water. He had even raised the dead. When he was arrested, he told his disciples that he didn't need their help. He didn't need them to defend him because if he wanted, he could have called 12 legions of angels to his side to, to protect him and help him. That's 72,000 angels. That was more angels than Pilate had soldiers. Jesus had willingly submitted to the arresting mob in the garden to the Jews and their silly little trials, to the beating from the soldiers and now to Pilate, Jesus wasn't helpless. He was the almighty, eternal Son of God, the God who had created the world and created the universe. Jesus had submitted himself willingly to a cunning and powerful Jewish high priest and to a powerful Roman governor. Why did he do that? The answer is simple. Because the Son of God loves you. He stood before the Jewish leaders and he let them condemn him because he wanted to be there. He stood before Pontius Pilate and let Pilate's soldiers whip him and beat him and crucify him because he wanted to be there. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen. The abuse, the mocking, the whipping, the beating, the crucifixion, even the torture of hell and the abandonment by God himself because he wanted to be there. He willingly endured it all because he chose to obey his heavenly Father who had so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. The reason for all the pain and the suffering of God's Son was because this was the way that God himself had determined to rescue and reclaim condemned and dying sinners. He sent his Son as the sacrifice and the substitute for all humanity, sacrificing him for the sins of the whole world. And we, we didn't deserve this willing sacrifice by the Son of God. We were the ones who were guilty of the failures to obey God's holy commands. 
We were the ones who were guilty of disobeying God. We were the ones who, by our disobedience, brought the sentence of punishment and eternal death and hell on ourselves. We were the ones who deserved the abuse, the shame, the crown of thorns, the nails, the whipping, the beating, and the cross. We were the ones who deserved the eternal punishment of hell. We deserved it all because of our sin. And yet, while we were still sinners, while we were still rebelling against God and thumbing our nose at him, Christ died for us. We were rescued from everything that we had coming to us. We were rescued by God's grace. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was for you and it was for me. Because he is the Son of God, his sacrifice was was more than sufficient to pay for the sin of the world of sinners of all time. It was sufficient to pay for your sins. It was sufficient to pay for my great and my many sins. We are redeemed, as Martin Luther said, by his holy, precious blood and by his innocent suffering and death. Jesus willingly subjected himself to flawed human authority so that you and I would be forgiven. And Jesus did all this because he loved you. He did this because he clearly saw his mission and he willingly and he faithfully carried it out. Now, now Pilate never understood this. Pilate had no clue about Jesus' mission. Pilate knew nothing and had no understanding of the Old Testament scriptures that talked about the coming of the Messiah and his work. And he had no appreciation whatsoever for God's plan to rescue sinners through the saving mission of his one and only son. Even when his wife sent him that note saying, don't have anything to do with that man, Pilate still didn't get it. The Jewish leaders didn't get it either. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And yes, unlike Pilate, they knew very well those Old Testament scriptures about the Messiah and his coming and his saving work. But they didn't get it either. They were so blinded by their thirst and their lust for power and position and glory that they missed the Savior's mission, which they had so clearly read about and read to the people every single Sabbath as they read the scriptures to the people in the synagogues. They never got it either. But Jesus clearly understood his mission, which was to save sinners from death and hell. Jesus himself was the one who had said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And so Jesus didn't whimper and whine about the abuse, the mocking, the beating, the nails, the crucifixion, or even the pain of hell itself. He loved us and willingly laid down his life for us. Jesus was ready and willing to fulfill his mission for us. He was our substitute. We cannot remove the sins of anyone, much less remove even our own sins. Only one could do that for us the Son of God who willingly laid down his life for us. The nails were driven through his flesh. And the cross was raised on Calvary. We see his cross and we hear his words, it is finished. It's done. Our sin is paid for in full. Our salvation is now a completed fact because the Son of God laid down his life for us. 
see his cross and understand what it means. Praise God that Jesus, the Son of God, willingly died for us. Amen.